Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we do live reads with amazingly talented authors of all genres. I'm Christy Stratus, historical suspense and historical fantasy author, and my awesome co-hosts are epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens and sci-fi author David M. Kelly. Lurking for Thank Legends you. is an interactive broadcast, and we encourage viewers to chime in with any questions for our guests or comment on what we are reading to you. So tonight, we're very excited to have contemporary fiction author Jody Swanell. Welcome, Jody. Thank you. I appreciate being here. Thanks, guys. I'm really grateful. It's great to have you here, and we've, uh, we've been looking forward to it. Uh, we, you know, everybody here knows that we had to move it by a week. So we really appreciate everybody, you know, tuning in anyway. I know it's, uh, you know, it can be kind of last minute, but these things happen. What are you going to do? Right. So uh, we really appreciate you tuning in. So Jody, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us what you write a little bit about you. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm basically, I have, I'm new to writing. So I just started my first novel, the beginning of last year, and I published it in March. Um, I've always been an avid reader and writing in journals and stuff like that, but that was the first time I decided, okay, that's it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go ahead and publish a book, and and I went through a lot, a huge learning curve, and and worked on that. Um, I'm not from Kitchener area, but I've lived here for maybe over 20 years now, but I'm from up north. So I was born in Cabos Casing and I grew up um, in military bases. So I moved around a lot and got to meet a lot of uh, interesting people. And uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> cool, cool. So did you just like jump into writing or did you do some like learn like uh, classes or courses or anything first? I jumped. Yeah, yeah, so that's I, cool. yeah. Cool. I didn't take any classes. I, I mean, I was taking like a web design course at uh, McMaster University, trying to learn mm -hmm. how to use the computer and stuff. And then that they discontinued that. So I, I really like designing and writing things. And I, like I said, I was always journaling, writing with pen. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, my son's girlfriend actually caught me. I thought, oh, I'm going to write a book. I started, you know, writing it. And she said, what are you doing? And uh, I'm like, nothing. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and then I told her I'm writing a book. And she said, well, I want to read it. And as soon as she said that, I thought, OK, now I've got to do it. And I just, you know, buckled down. I started learning from everything, like starting with, uh, OK, I need to write in New Times Roman and double space and indentation. I, I had to learn from scratch everything. Well, you know what? That, that is totally amazing. I just met Jody a couple months ago at uh, one of the local uh, writers groups. and. You would never know she's just jumped into uh, being a writer. I've done a couple of book events with her now, and she her booth setup is second to none. It looks better than most booths yeah. that are there. Aw, that's because amazing. She seems to do very well there. I think you she outsold me at the last one we just did, so I'm, I'm a little <laughs> jealous. I could probably learn something from Jody, and Jody's been doing it <laughs> with Maya. So, uh, no, she did amazing, and uh, I've, I've got one of her books, and uh, I read it, and I really enjoyed it. So, uh, Jody, you've uh, jumped in with both that's feet. That's fantastic. But, uh, you're doing really well. I was um, determined. <laughs> and another thing too is that uh, we had a meeting last a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the host of the writing group uh, couldn't come, and Jody stepped in, and she ran the whole meeting, and she did an amazing <laughs> job. Like you would never know if she's just new to writing because uh, the answer she gave the newer writers that were asking questions, uh, <laughs> she just knew them like that, and she was snapping them off. I thought, wow, that's I would never know you were a new writer. That is great. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. That's I'm very grateful for that. Cause I mean, I, I hold you in high esteem. The first the first book fest that we went to, my husband and son were drooling over Richard's dragons, you know, <laughs> cool. in the parking lot. And then we're like, oh, he must be really famous. That's so cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, check out his books. And they were nervous to go near you. Oh no. no. <laughs> it was funny. That's that is funny. So but it's funny, isn't it, how, how we all have these same experiences? Because, I mean, like, Richard, you were saying, like, when you came to see me that time at the yes. uh, at the event, you were sort of like, oh, my God, it's like David Kelly. Right. He's, he's a big author, you know? Sort of <laughs> I love it. I've never been to a Comic-Con in my life, and I, I met David through uh, Facebook, one of the author groups there, because I didn't know how to do Amazon, and he helped me set up my account on Amazon in 2017. Oh, nice. And he was doing an event in London, Ontario at uh, Forest City Comic-Con, I probably go down to see him. I got to see this famous author uh, selling his wares and signing books. I thought that was so cool because I'd never actually done something like that. And 
Very cool. I, I've learned from David. Actually, my very first con that I actually did some book signings was up in uh, David's hometown. Uh, mm, we did the Subway Graphic Con, and uh, I sat there twiddling my thumbs, uh, hoping someone would even look at my table while Dave's sitting there signing books. And wow, yeah, mm, so. I don't think I saw, I don't think I was signing that many. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about but it's not, it's but, a lot yeah, of fun. I guess it's relative. <laughs> yeah, no, these these cons are very good. And well, I was talking to Jody off stage uh, or off camera and uh, about uh, the event we did last week. Uh, it was okay. It was mediocre for uh, something that I normally do. But uh, I love being there with a bunch of authors, and uh, I love meeting new book fans. So even though it was kind of a long day, uh, it was it, they're always worthwhile to go to because uh, it's nice talking about your books yeah. and you know getting books into new people's hands. And uh, every time, every now and then, you get a return reader, and that's really gratifying. So mm -hmm. that's very enjoyable. And it stayed dry. I was yeah, really it dry. Just <laughs> Threaten the rain all weekend, and it was actually a very good weekend. So before we start, Christy, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on with the Christy Stratosphere? Oh, well, we have big news. Prohibited Magic is finally publishing to Kindle Vela. So it's a little bit later than I planned, but I did have to. Yeah, thank yes, you. Yes, I saw that. That's awesome. Very exciting. So this is book three in Grimoire Society of Dark Acts, um, which is Gaslamp Fantasy. So um, currently on Vela, it is also, you can read it on Patreon as well, patreon.com slash Christy Stratus. And uh, you get it there first. So you get it there on Friday, and then you get it on Vela on Monday. And today on Vela, all four of the first episodes posted. So episodes one to four are now, now available. Episodes one to three are free on Vela. The fourth one you do have to start paying for from you know episode four forward. But on my Patreon, episodes one to four are free. So definitely check that out. It's only a dollar a month and you can read every episode ahead of time. So I'm super excited about it. I'm currently writing um, episode 10, so I'm well ahead and um you know getting good feedback already so that's exciting awesome Great yeah news. yeah super exactly. excited about it and also you got you new covers as well haven't you christy yeah i got new covers yes that was a whole thing i initially was going to get one new cover done um i was looking at all these places like shutterstock and it was just so much ai and i really wanted a human mm -hmm. cover designer to do it for me you know so um, so I worked with Con Lavery. He's fantastic. He's designed my website. I work with him all the time. And um, he actually made remade all of my covers so that they all go together. And I love them. They're really, oh, really cool. They look very nice. I saw them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We've had him on here a few times. So. Yeah, he's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, that's neat. How about you, Dave? What's new in the David Kelly universe? Um, uh, what's new in my universe? I finally got my suspension back on my car. <laughs> You, you, had your license, you had your license suspended. No, my suspension. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I finally got it all back together, uh, which has been like a major pain in the um, rear yep. end. <laughs> no pun intended. No pun intended. Uh, and so I, I then dropped it off the, the ramps and uh, found out that I had one of my tires was goddamn flat. So <laughs> then I had to sort that out. It's just never ending. One after the other. Uh, yeah. But on the writing front, um, I have started editing my uh, Joe Ballen prequel novella. Nice. Uh, and I'm about a third of the way through that now. Um, and I am still working on the next uh, Hyperia Jones book. Uh, I'm around about, probably about 30% into the way in, 30% of the way into that at the moment. Um, but other than that, try and as I say mostly to put my car back together so I can actually drive it this year. I hope <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've been more greasy than keyboardy. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Richard? Yeah, no, I'm about ninety-two thousand words into book four in the High Cliff Guardian series. Mm -hmm. It's coming along slowly, Great. but. Uh, I think the action is starting to pick up, so that's going to help the writing yes. pick up as well. So we're getting near the, the climax of the four books. Yeah, yeah. Richard does live reads sometimes while he's editing, and I missed the last one. And I was really upset. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, cool. Yeah, yeah so. I've kind of seen that once. I wasn't sure what was going on. I was yeah, kind cool. of scrolling through, and then I, I was like, "Oh, that's neat." It's just another way to edit. Actually, it's, yeah. that's why I do it. I, I don't really mm -hmm. look for engagement when I'm doing that, but it's nice when people come in, and that's how I met Christy, actually. So, oh wow, she happened to find me on a library, yeah. and uh, <laughs> it was like the only one who kept tuning in. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would never do that because, like, nobody 
nobody nobody ever sees my first drafts at all nothing it's like no way it's like until i redrafted it it's like it's not leaving my the my clutched fingers you know sort of thing. <laughs> it's, it's just another, there's so many different ways to edit your book and you know obviously yeah. someone else edited it as well but when you're doing your own editing phases you, you do it on paper you do it on the computer you do it by leaving it reading it out loud so that's just another way to it especially for dialogue i find reading it out loud really helps you mm -hmm. smooth the dialogue because when you write these purple prose in your dialogue it sounds so awesome when you're typing it on your computer yeah. but read it out loud it's that sounds right. awful corny <laughs> no one ever speaks like that and you change it so that's a, it's a great way to edit oh. a book but, uh, I, I as far as events go uh, i have another event coming up this weekend this is my premier event that all year i look forward to this day it's the fergus medieval fair and oh, that's it is my nice. genre and i rock this one like i do a lot of writers festivals and i don't sell a lot of books at writers festivals because most people are there for other stuff other than fantasy and there's always so much fantasy in a writers festival that you know you're just this tiny little fish in this big ocean but uh when i do the fergus medieval fair i'm it so uh, people look forward to my books and I do very well there. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully the rain will hold off. And, uh, and then uh, we're doing another one. I'm doing, oh, I'm doing a charity uh, event in Hamilton on uh, July 29th called Neighbor to Neighbor. It's uh, to help uh, Hamilton cha uh, charity. Uh, I think they, they look after uh, people that aren't as well to do. So I'll be there in Hamilton. And if you check my website, www.richardhaystevens.com. Yeah, you'll see all the events uh, on my appearances tab. My wife always updates it. So I hope to see some of you out there, and I'd love to sign a book or just say hi. So that's about it with me right now. Nice. And uh, before we came on air, we discussed that we're going to do Jody first. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we actually had an arm wrestling competition. And, uh, <laughs> I lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. okay. Yeah. So we're going to let you set it up, Jody. So... And I'm just gonna just start with a brief, brief yep. part of the scene, and yeah, then you can, let, uh, you can let people know just the way you sent it to us. You can let people know who we are and uh, who's playing what character, and you can do the brief thing of the scene. And okay, okay, yep, I'll set up the story for us. Am I ready? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yep, it's all yours. Okay, so um, I will be narrating and uh, reading for the protagonist, my main character. That's twenty-six-year-old. Kim Hart, she's a happy restaurant manager that finds herself thrust into a world on the brink of destruction. Uh, Christy's going to be Anna, Kim's neighbor, who works for Nexus and specializing in studying companions. And companions are symbiotic collective consciousness made of the microbiome in vertebrates, all vertebrates. Uh, Christy's also going to be Julia. Kim's older sister, and a couple of uh, Nexus staff, Veronica and Priya. So we'll keep you busy reading. And they're assigned to study Kim's immediate home environment for evidence of interference from the hidden fourth dimension. Uh, Richard's going to be reading Ramish. Uh, he's Anna's colleague from Nexus and has a senior position in the department designated to companion research. And he's Kim's new love interest. Uh, Richard's also going to be the pizza delivery driver, <laughs> as a brief line, and Billy, who uh, works for Nexus, and he's the head of the AI department and one of the technical geniuses responsible for the creation and maintenance of Nexus Company's AI program, and the AI is called Zvax. Now, David will be reading Ken, which is Billy's assistant and historical researcher. He's also going to be playing Zvax. The artificial intelligence program that runs high-tech equipment studies of the fourth dimension and the dark matter parasites within it. He's also going to be reading for Jacob, who is Kim's dearest best friend. So the scene we're going to start from is uh, from chapter five of the novel. And the novel's called Dark Reaction. I don't know if that was mentioned. So <laughs> uh, we're going to start, Kim is at Nexus. That's a big company in Hamilton in the computer lab, and she's with some staff members learning about what steps the company has taken to mitigate the parasitic invasion from the dark matter dimension. So I'll just jump in and start narrating. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Billy's face was flushed from breathing heavily when he stormed in and joined us. He plunked himself down on one of the wing chairs. 
Ramish followed shortly after and regarded the holographic graphs above the coffee table for a few seconds before sitting beside me. I see Ken and Susie have shown you the postulation index, Ramish said disdainfully. Susie threw her hands in the air. The hologram was here before I showed up. Don't bring me into this. It's fine, Susie. I'm not hiding anything from Kim. Ramesh turned to me. Zivak wants you to provide a sample of your bone marrow. Okay. I suppose it's going to sting, right? I winced. Don't worry about the pain. Nexus has painkillers that are so effective they'll make you think you went for a massage. Ken winked. Zivax requested we get a biopsy to look deeper into your biology. You have macrocytosis. Your red blood cells are larger than normal, and you also have a fast heartbeat. Billy said. I didn't know that. Is it serious? I asked. Hard to say without further examination. Red blood cells carry oxygen. From what I understand, it could simply mean you're borderline anemic. Nexus is researching and logging everything about your health and lifestyle. Billy answered. If you thought you had any privacy, think again, Susie said sarcastically. What was that other thing you found? z -backs? Billy sat back in his chair, his color returning to normal. We discovered two infrequent non-coding DNA sequences in Kim's genome. One of the strands of DNA serves an unknown functional role that might decipher why Kim seems to have protection against attachment or feeding from the Dirachnids. The other transposon regulates the enzyme responsible for bacteria tolerance. This special gene allows Kim's bacteria to flourish, which could help explain her exceptionally healthy microbiome. The mutation may be key to the human companion relationship. Zivax responded. Billy leered at Ramish, and I sensed he was using his companion to communicate. Ramish tented his fingertips and gave Billy a brutal look in return. Zvax, any records of similar non-coding DNA in your database? Ramish asked. Yes, samples of the same sequences are in the remains of human sacrifices from a Mayan temple in Chichen Itza. Specifically, a priest chamber where all human remains have the same mutagen. Let me guess. The alligator chamber? Billy said. That is correct. Zivak said. That's where Diego found his jadeite meteor sample with the tiny fraction of the exotic matter he's been so obsessed with for the past 10 years. It was in the belly of an alligator near the secret chamber. The reptile had a few stones that it swallowed, probably so it could dive deeper. That's why the temple beside it was named the Alligator Chamber. Billy explained to the rest of us. That's interesting. I spent months studying the classified dark codex found in that temple. They sacrificed members of not one of the tribes to appease their god from the dream world, Puchi. The codex described a mysterious world overlapping ours, calling with evil monsters that Puchi would unleash upon them if they didn't perform a monthly ritual. Approximately every 30 years, according, coinciding with Saturn's orbit, they would also have a mass sacrifice of hundreds of tribespeople at once. The timeline corresponded to the Dirachnid life cycle. We presume the ritual was to counteract the, the egg hatch. Ken said thoughtfully. It sounded morbidly absurd, but at the same time, these ancient Mayan priests were onto something. They knew too much about the fourth dimension, the Dirachnids, and their life cycle. I was disturbed by hearing they targeted folks with the same rare non-coding DNA that I had and was none too impressed with the god Pucci. Project Arrow has taken precedent anyway, so I doubt Zvax's index will mean anything. I hope for victory. Then we can get on to the fun stuff like augmented reality. Susie said and applied a lip balm. We all hope for the project's success. I'm concerned because Zvax is concerned. Billy said pointedly. Susie turned to stare at Ramesh. Kim has agreed to participate in the Gamma Project. Samuel has an expressed interest in the Gamma Project and will focus on Project Arrow. I'll take Kim to get the bone marrow sample. We'll hope for the best. Ramesh stood and looked down at me. If you come with me, we'll visit the Meteorcorium. We said goodbye to the group at the computer lab and headed to the exit. 
What exactly is non-coding DNA? I asked in the elevator. Picture a birthday cake. If DNA gives you the ingredients, then non-coding DNA tells you when the birthday is and how much cake to make. You may be familiar with the term junk DNA. We're learning that even what seems to be scrap has a purpose. Ramesh said. Fascinating, I said. We found the Metacorium crowded with people and mobile units. Inside and out were lineups of Nexus staff getting their nanobot infused shots. Ramesh escorted me to a reasonably vacant area compared to the rest of the medical center and was kind enough to wait. Ken was right. I donated a sample of my bone marrow and it was painless. The nurse applied a local anesthetic with a cotton ball and I didn't feel the needle in my hip bone. After the biopsy, we rode the shuttle back to Commune A where we sat on the bench for a few minutes before ordering me a ride home. How many injections are being administered to start with, I asked. Nexus outlined this vaccination plan years ago. They've invested untold amounts of money in nanotechnology, medical equipment, and staff on call waiting for the go-ahead. Ramesh flipped through something on his phone. If I were to guess, I would say once they ramp it up to the general public, they'll be able to give out six or seven million doses daily. That's great news. Will the companions heal? We don't know for sure. We hope the children can grow in adulthood without ever having to experience the invading parasite feeding off them. Society will have a new mentality, competent generation. <laughs> Sorry, a new mentally competent generation without the hindrance of sociopathic personalities lacking empathy. He said. Ramesh reached into his pocket and handed me a small jewelry box. I took it and looked up at him. Are you giving me a present? I framed the words in my mind as I looked into his eyes. He blinked twice, which I had come to realize meant no. Scolding myself internally for feeling disappointed, I turned the box over to inspect it. What's this? Nexus would like you to wear it at all times. This waterproof health monitor is called a Welxus. It will track your vitals 24-7. Ramesh said. I opened the box to find a stylish stainless steel bracelet with a simple braided design. It was dainty and, unlike my smartwatch, had no prominent components. According to the instructions, it only needed to be charged for an hour once a week. At least it's pretty, I said. So are you. My heart raced, and I cursed myself for putting the bracelet on already. Zvax is probably recording an anomaly right now. I smiled weakly at him and fiddled with my hair. Ramesh turned away, and I saw the little blue electric car pull up with Cynthia behind the wheel. Lay low, and please, try to stay close to home for the next few days. I'll be in touch soon. Ramesh opened the car door. Okay, thank you. I touched his arm lightly, and he smiled before backing away. On the ride home, I clutched the seat and stayed quiet as Cynthia weaved in and out of side roads and alleys. Zivex directed her, and although we took an extra 15 minutes to get home, we only witnessed a couple of fender benders and one house fire. Cynthia explained that the alleys and side roads were safer because troublemakers had moved from the shadowy neighborhoods to the main roadways. I relaxed once inside my house, musing as Loki carried one of Jacob's dirty socks and ran to maul me. What's this, baby? Thank you. I sat on the floor to take off my shoes and threw the sock at Jacob. I was listening to the news and the public health department just announced a new COVID vaccination against another dangerous variant. There's a hotline for people to make appointments around the clock. Military and mobile units are getting set up all over the city. Jacob said, I put my shoes and purse away. Did they? It's amazing how efficient Nexus is. I feed it with something like that. He closed the app on his phone. Yeah, they've been sitting on Project Arrow for about a decade. Dad's rock sample provided the missing piece, puzzle piece, and they have launched the planned attack on the invaders, I said dramatically. Too bad they didn't start it before the hatching. The radio station also reported several assaults and a bunch of property damage. The main highway is gridlocked from multiple pileups as well. Jacob crossed his arms. I exhaled. It's fucking scary out there, Jacob. Jacob described his day as uneventful. 
The science girls in the basement were so quiet that he had popped his head downstairs partway through the day to see if they were there. Priya whispered to him that it was Veronica's turn to sleep. They took turns, so one of them was always awake to check the readings. They watched to see whether the resonance fluctuations recorded were spontaneous or had a pattern. I recounted my day to him, explaining that Project's, Project Arrow's nanotechnology was in the COVID vaccines coming out for the new variant. I also described the strange and creepy connection between my junk DNA and Mayan sacrifices. I would love to get my hands on that classified Mayan codex. Jacob rubbed his hands together as a fly does when it cleans itself. I figured you would. As soon as the guys talked about secret chambers, sacrifices, and rituals, I thought of you. I lightly punched him on the shoulder. You know what I like. He wiggled his eyebrows at me, making me laugh. For dinner, we ate pizza paid for by Priya, who assured us she was using a Nexus credit card. The pizza came almost an hour late. You're muted, Richard. <laughs> Should I continue? The delivery driver told us he looked like he seen a ghost and darted away like he was being chased by one. Poor kid, Priya said. I closed the door while she took the pizza to the table. I insisted Veronica and Priya eat in the dining room with us since they provided the meal. I wolfed down three slices and listened to Jacob question the girls about the structure of the fabric of our reality. The three-dimensional flower of life pattern can describe the gravi gravitational field of any object in our dimension. Zvax has postulated that the laws that govern the particles in the hidden fourth dimension are quite different. Veronica said. We believe the wavelength of the most fundamental fragment of dark matter is longer and vibrates slower than those in our dimension. It hardly interacts with the electromagnetic field and is essentially cold. Priya said. Do you think there's intelligent life in the dark dimension? Jacob asked. Priya and Veronica looked at each other for a split second, and Veronica sipped her soda. <laughs> Hard to say. Priya blushed, brushed her bangs out of her eyes. <laughs> intelligent life has not been ruled out because we know so little about WIMPs. W-I-M-P-S. <laughs> Usually, time is considered the fourth dimension. That's why the dark matter dimension is called the hidden fourth dimension. I understand four dimensions. If I tell Kim to meet me at Bean Island Cafe, I can give her the location in three dimensions. If I don't tell her the fourth, what time to meet me, my coffee will get cold while I wait for her to show up. Jacob winked at me and the girls laughed. <laughs> Where is this hidden dimension? It's right here. Veronica opened her arms wide. The dark matter dimension is superimposed on ours. Visualize a holographic image on a two-dimensional baseball card. You can turn it slightly and see a three-dimensional image. So if I could turn our world sideways, I could see the hidden dimension? Jacob's eyes searched the room as if he was trying. Dark matter moves incredibly slow and everything, including a stone in our world, is vibrating fast and hot within it, Veronica said. Kind of makes me think of the Chinese yin and yang, hot versus cold and fast versus slow, all within each other, I said. Mathematically, it's much more complicated than that, but I see how you could make that connection. Veronica smiled at me like I was a child. Jacob's phone rang, and he excused himself to take the call. I could hear he was speaking with his new friend, Matt. Veronica and Priya returned to work in the basement, and I took Loki to the backyard. I dialed Julia's number for a video call to see how they made out in the Nexus residence. She walked around the place holding her phone camera so I could look at the elegant condo. Holy crap, Jules, what a view, I said. I know, it's beautiful. It overlooks Lake Ontario. So, don't keep me waiting, I said. Jeffrey has accepted the possession for a one-year contract. Julia's white teeth gleamed on my screen. That's great, I said, delighted. How are you holding up? I asked, feeling sad suddenly, knowing that living here meant she could have seen our father more often if he was still alive. 
I'm holding up well enough, considering I miss Dad terribly. It's strange being here in Hamilton and not going to the Dune Care Center. We talked briefly about him, then I chatted with Sherry, who showed me some pictures she colored, which roused my desire to start another art project myself. After ending the call, I found Jacob waiting in the kitchen for me. I'm going home tomorrow if you think you'll be okay. Of course, I'll check in on you, but if you need, and if you need anything, call me. Jacob cocked his head sideways, watching for my reaction. I'm good, thank you. I peered out the window to see the unmarked security vehicle parked on the street with two Nexus officers watching the house. The next few days were blissfully uneventful. Jacob left early in the morning before I woke and left a note with instructions to behave and call regularly. Veronica and Priya stayed for two more days but were almost invisible. I spent the first day reorganizing my spare room so I could start a new painting. It had been a while since I'd fostered my creative side now with the opportunity to relax, I played my favorite music and enjoyed focusing my mind on artistic expression. Mixing the colors to create a unique picture on a blank canvas, canvas made me feel like a magician, and I found it to be therapeutic. Loki woke me up on the third day, whining in my face. I opened my eyes to the usual sloppy kisses and a wagging tail. My phone showed I had slept two hours past when I just usually just got out of bed. Just let me get my robe on and I'll let you out, sweetie. I poured cereal into a bowl while watching him run around in the backyard. He was sniffing the packed grass where the sensors that Priya and Veronica removed the previous day had left indentations. They'd packed their gear last night when Nexus reached out to them, saying they'd collected enough data at my place. I was to keep wearing the Welksis monitor that Ramish gave me. He sent me several messages checking how I was doing and informing me that the bone marrow tests didn't reveal anything special. I was putting a load of laundry in the washer when the doorbell rang. Loki beat me to the entrance and I opened the door to see Anna with unusually messy hair looking like she hadn't slept. Jesus Christ, Anna, you look like shit. Come in the house, I blurted. Thanks. She stepped inside and looked over her shoulder self-consciously at the security detail parked outside our houses. What's the matter, I asked. She flipped her shoes off and went to sit on my couch. Loki jumped on her lap and she hugged him. Oh, Kim, it's a fucking disaster. She ran her fingers through her hair. I tensed. She was scaring me. What happened? Project Arrow. It's completely backfired. I dropped into the chair across from her. What do you mean it backfired? I remembered Billy's warning. Images flashed flashed through my mind of people getting sick from radiation poisoning or torn apart from the inside out. At first, everything went as expected. The nanobots successfully inserted Project Arrow's synthetic particles into the targeted glands. It was wonderful, and we celebrated. The Dirachnids stopped feeding, and follow-up tests, follow tests showed that they had disappeared. Anna sniffed. Where'd they go? We didn't know at first. We feel foolishly hoped they were poisoned and died. Anna put both her hands on her cheeks. They didn't go far. Wherever they went, they had undergone a type of biological metamorphosis. Oh, no. Zvax concluded that the Dirachnids and larvae were under stress from hunger. Initially, the synthetic particles repelled them, but they also provoked a physical and behavioral change. The people who received the injection came in to get rescanned. The Dirachnids had reattached them to them with bloated stylets and fed more aggressively. The transformed parasites behaved like a single-minded swarm, hyper-focused on the pineal gland. Anna looked crazed. The end. <laughs> Thank you, guys. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that was great. That was really great. My apologies. It was funny because uh, Jody said, should we continue? And I looked back at the screen and Chrissy seemed like she was laughing. And I thought, you know, should you continue? Because Chrissy's laughing. And then I, I, I sat back down in front of the screen after I'd done the pizza guy. And I looked and I was mute. And I go, my God. <laughs> at least be a bit of And it, about two lines, two paragraphs before that, I knew I was muted. I'm thinking, OK, make sure you unmute. Make sure, oh, don't <laughs> out, I will unmute. I'm not like that. And sure enough, I did that's how it always has to work. It must. Oh, you, you I love it, the pizza box. That could have been well, your Oscar-winning moment. It could have been. <laughs> and there was there was one word I tried. I go through the manuscripts beforehand, and I try to look for words that I'm going to struggle with. And I must have missed this one. And the word was 
medicorium. Yeah. I think I call it mediocre. <laughs> All of a sudden, my tongue just got twisted in a knot, and I go, oh, my goodness. I know. I, it looks better when you write it, right? You know, I'm thinking, oh, oh yeah. Nice no, I just screwed it up. And I was thinking, I was hoping when I said it that this is going to be the only instance of that word in this text. And then you said it afterwards properly. And oh, my goodness. No, it was good. It was good. It was good. <laughs> I really, really appreciate fun. it. So what did you think of that, Jody? That was great. I had a blast. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. You guys are fun. <laughs> I, I know you're nervous about it, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just a fun I'm thing. I'm uh, going to go away for a little while, and I shall be back. All okay. right. Dave, are you going to go off camera there? <clears throat> or are you just going to mute? That's fine. Yeah, there it goes. Okay, so now we got to get the other one, right? Yeah, so we'll pull up Dave's. Thank you, Anita. So we've had uh, different comments come in here. I don't know if you saw them when I was posting them on the screen. I didn't know no. if I was throwing you off there. I don't see them. Oh, no? No. Oh, you maybe don't see them on the side. Yeah, but I was putting them down at the bottom here. Do you see that now? Maybe. Oh, I wasn't even. I was on the private chat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. I That's see where it's them. automatically. Oh, okay. Margaret Pinard, uh, she she generally joins us and she makes a point of coming and seeing us. So <laughs> I did get the mask, right? Wasn't his mask amazing? I loved it. Yeah, I, awesome. I'm always looking at my I'm always looking at my third screen and all of a sudden I look back and I saw well, I didn't see Dave. I saw what the hell? You saw Zvax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was awesome. He showed it to me before when you guys weren't here, so I knew it was coming. Oh, oh yeah. I love that. I love <laughs> yeah. We used to see some of the masks he makes out of paper. That's cool. He made a rhinoceros mask once, and it was something else. Yeah, oh, he like really? actually put it on his like over his head. Yeah, yeah it was like a cool helmet. Thing, yeah. You know, he three D wow. printed it. It was really cool. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. I guess I better pull Dave's up before we get in there. So that was a great reading, Jody. You, you did well. Yeah. Like a professional. Yeah. Was yeah. it good? No. You yeah. have an easy yeah. to listen to voice. Oh, thank you. I thought that the same about you guys, and I was worried because I thought, okay, don't. My husband said, "Don't race through it. You're going too fast." I'm like yeah. I want to get it over with. <laughs> I'm scared. That was always my knock. My my wife always said that to me when I first started doing live reads. She said, uh, "You read too fast." Yeah. yeah, it's easy to do that. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, for sure. You get nervous or whatever. Yeah. So I'm supposed to be debonair and sophisticated and handsome. I don't think I can do any of those three, but he says, think Cary Grant. And I'm like, oh, I don't think I'm Cary Grant, but I'm going to wear a suit. So maybe that'll offset it. Nice. I think you'll do great. I'm a smooth operator. <laughs> you are a smooth operator. Yeah. <laughs> and you're also the youngest daughter. I'm also a nine-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. I have met once a smooth operator male and a young, <laughs> young girl. <laughs> nice. I wanted to get a, a bow for my hair, but I just, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get anything to show on my. <laughs> and Jody, it looks like you're my wife and it says you're patient. And that, that would patient. probably sum up what you need to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> oh, but you were involved with Doug in college. Who's Doug? <laughs> I'm Doug. Oh. <laughs> ah, oh. oh, the competition. A little animosity. <laughs> Indeed. Nice Sweet. mustache. All right. Maybe here's Cary Grant. Do I look before. like Cary Grant now? Better. The suit no. looks good. It does. You'll have to work on your dimple. Was that supportive? <laughs> 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 All right, Dave, if you want to introduce us and your story. Okay. Uh, did you describe the characters? Uh, I, I didn't do anything, Dave. No, I was leaving okay. that all to you. Yeah, we were just having a nice discussion. We're talking about you. Okay. Um, so uh, this is uh, an excerpt from uh, my story, A Place in the Sun, uh, which is based on the classic novel and uh, movie, uh, Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House. Um, Largely, with science fiction things. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in this uh, reading, uh, Richard will be playing Jim Harding, who's uh, a debonair and sophisticated and handsome. He's uh, something very important in the World Congress, and he's really kind of Cary Grant. Um, Jody will be playing Joan Harding, who's Jim's wife. She's loyal, patient, and supportive. 
and she was also involved with Doug in college. M Muriel Harding is played by Christy. The Hard She's the Harding's youngest daughter, age nine, and somewhat precocious. Doug and the narrator is played by me. Liar, cynical, down to earth, having problems with his own marriage. Mike Budenich, also played by Christy, is a fast talking, smooth operator who knows the exact amount he can take a mug for just by looking at him. And he's the salesman in this uh, story. Nice. So, the setting. The Hardings live in a cramped apartment in the city because Jim has to be close to the World Congress where he's something big. When a company starts selling homes on other alternate Earths, Joan sees it as the perfect way to have a luxury home where they can live free and independently. When she starts bugging Jim over it, he calls his friend and lawyer, Doug, to help him out. They meet in a bar and have several drinks. You want me to begin? Sure. Are you ready? Okay. So you see, it's Joan. Jim was getting a little blurry. He was on his third martini after all. Uh, how can I leave the city when Congress is in session? But she insists. She spoke to Agnes. You know Agnes. And, of course, Tyrone. They're the worst, but they planted this thing in Joan's head. Now I can't get anything out of her. Sounds like you're in a pickle, old friend. Exactly. Jim waved to the waiter who brought him another martini. So come and explain it to her. You're my lawyer, after all. Uh, I don't handle domestic cases. You're a lawyer. You work for money. <sighs> Sometimes we get days like this. There's a mean streak in you I've never liked. Sue me. Do you know anything about this Nouveau Mondo outfit? Only what I see in the news. I have an appointment with them at three. I'd like you to come. Keep me out of trouble. That sort of thing. That would be a first. One more martini was enough to see me agreeing to go to the downtown sales room. Although after the liquid lunch, I wasn't sure if I was still covered by the bar association. The Nouveau Mondo office was big, brash, and loud, like a Texas used car salesman. The outside awash with the most garish of 3V displays imaginable. The door slid open as we approached, and we stepped inside to a perfectly controlled environment as warm and comforting as a mother's kiss. Gentlemen, how wonderful it is to see you this afternoon. I'm Mike Budenik, buddy by name, buddy by nature. Look here, Budenik. You people have got my wife in an awful tiz. There ought to be a law. There probably is. That's why I brought my lawyer. You can't go around planting strange ideas in other wives' heads. It's unconstitutional, damn it. If you want to do that sort of thing, stick to your own wives. But Nick sized Jim up in an instant. He stripped off Jim's Rudolph Rayburn Vanquish 2 suit, ran checks on Jim's credit chip, and even counted the loose change in Jim's pockets in a single beady glance. You have me at a disadvantage, sir. Your name, please? Harding. Jim Harding. But what's that got to do? Warn him off, Doug. You tell him. But Nick he hesitated, and I saw the tiny flash in his neck as his men plant fed every bit of data available on Jim directly to his brain. After that, he knew everything about who he was dealing with, right down to his inside leg measurement. Ah, uh, yes. Mr. Harding. Let me see. Joan, that is Mrs. Harding, came to see us just two weeks ago to get some preliminary information. I take it you're here to arrange a purchase? Jehoshaphat, not in your life. Jim stood tall for a moment, then the martinis pulled him back down. I'm not. Now, look here, old man. I don't mean to degenerate your business, but some of us can't simply leave town at the drop of a hat. I have important work to do here. It would be Irresponsible, impush. I, I can't leave. 
And that right there is the beauty of buying a home from Nuevo Mondo Inc. Our patented Tetraquince shift gate technology means that you can be in your home in minutes without even suffering the indignity of a transit tube. We're proud to say we now have shift gates in easy walking distance throughout every major city and town worldwide. What nonsense. Jim pulled out a sooth stick and activated it with a sharp flick, sucking in spicy aromatic fumes. What kind of idiot would trust a contraption like that? You're quite right, of course. But if you gentlemen would care to come this way, I'd like to show you just what it is that makes Nuevo Mondo the best choice for your new home. Jim was about to object, but now I admit I was curious. Come on, let's take a look. We came all the way down here and I wouldn't mind learning more. And it would help your discussion with Joan. Uh, all right. But Nick led us to a side door and held it open. I stepped through behind Jim and walked slap bang into the middle of his back. He stopped just inside the door. And when I recovered from the collision, I understood why. Instead of the expected office, we were on a broad concrete patio overlooking an open vista of rolling hills, lush wetlands, and thick forest. In the distance, a herd of long-necked dinosaurs munched happily on ferns, braying occasionally over the primeval landscape. Show me your horse of that. Is that some kind of trick? Jim edged forward towards the thick wire mesh that enclosed the patio area. Where's the city? <laughs> right where you left it. This is Earth Prime, the first alternate Earth Dr. Korolov discovered when he created the Tetra Quince Shift Gate. In this reality, the impact that killed off the dinosaurs never happened, and they still rule the world. Amazing, isn't it? A snot came over my shoulder, and I turned to see the barrel-headed, barrel-sized head of one of the dinosaur creatures lowering down towards me. Can't get it in camera, it's too big. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it blinked slowly, its giant chestnut eye level with mine. <laughs> That's a female brachiosaur. Sometimes they get curious. I imagine we smell peculiar to them. The brachiosaur brushed its slim nose against the cage and belched. A fetid stench of rotting vegetation engulfing us. We're not the only ones. We're not the only ones, I muttered past my fingers, holding my hand over my face. But how did we get here? Jim looked at me as if it was somehow my fault. Nuevo Mondo serves over 300 cities around the world. But it gestured at the lush greenery. Would you believe it, gentlemen? The, the company only has a single office. As we like to say, all roads lead to prime. My head was spinning from something other than the martinis. That still doesn't explain it. A flash of lightning broke the skies, which darkened rapidly. In less than a minute, fat drops of rain started to pelt us, and Budnick pointed back towards the door. We should go in. It's monsoon season. We barely got to the door before a deluge fell from the sky, bouncing over 10 centimeters up from the bone gray concrete of the patio. I ducked through the door, but was already soaked. Jim lifted a finger, then marched back through the showroom and out to the front entrance. He returned a moment later, his long face managing to somehow look puzzled and taciturn at the same time. Jim, I... He held up his finger again, opened the door to the patio and stuck his head momentarily outside. When he moved back, his perfectly groomed hair was wet. It's not raining out there. He gestured to the front door. But it's raining out here? 
and the city? Allow me to explain. Wouldn't it guided us to a couple of comfortable armchairs snugged around a polished oak coffee table. The entrance you came through is one of our shift gates. When anyone enters our showroom, they are instantly transported here. The gate remembers who you are and where you came from, automatically sending you back there when you leave. It saves a fortune in rent. Apart from the storefront, this entire building is located in Tishomango, Mississippi. Where? Exactly. <laughs> I need a drink. Jim said with a determined passion I sympathized with. Budnick grinned and reached under the desk. A hidden door slid open in the middle of the coffee table and a mini bar popped up. I reached for a glass, but Jim had already beaten me to it and was pouring himself a bourbon. It wasn't a small one either. You didn't feel a thing, did you? Budnick helped himself to a small Bloody Mary. Admit it. I thought I remembered a slightly odd sensation as we entered, but perhaps that was rationalizing after the fact. Certainly nothing had occurred to make me feel something significant had happened, if it had. You can do that anywhere? Well, there are some limits, but not in a practical sense. Let me see. But Nick made a show of pulling a data pad out of the inside pocket of his over shiny suit and tapped a few times on the screen. The thin surface filled immediately with information that neither of us could see clearly. It was a sham. The mem plant had already supplied him with everything he needed to know about it, his prospect. You work at the World Congress, Mr. Harding, and your personal office is on the corner of 18th and Fairfax. The nearest gate to you is next door to Horwald's on Willoughby, less than a three-minute walk. Jim had that look on his face I'd seen many times with clients, one that says they're hooked. It's the kind of look you see in small animals just as they reach for the bait in the trap. Hang on, Jim. What about Joan and the girls? Don't you see? Your wife has already tried the gates downtown. They're right next to all the main stores. There's even one inside Marcy's. Also, the gates serving the girls' schools are within a five minutes walk. And with kids, you know, it's all a big adventure anyway. Jim, just a... a... Shh. And how much does all this cost, Mr. Budnich? Access to the shift gates is included in all of our estate packages. The company takes care of all maintenance at no cost to the client, of course. That was it. That was the bombshell right there. And the estate package pricing, I butted in, ignoring Jim's warning glance. How much do those cost? Building costs are on par with any modern custom construction. Our consultants work extensively with the client to ensure that everything is satisfactory. I doubled the number I'd initially thought of. The biggest decision for the client is simply how much world they want to pay for. There are infinite possibilities for environment, climate, location, terrain. I quadrupled the cost in my head. Jim, apart from the cottage, you've never lived in anything but an apartment. Buying a house is a tricky thing. With the premium on land globally, and especially in the major population centers, old-fashioned individual homes were impractical nowadays, and almost everyone lived in apartments. Exactly, but that's what Joan wants. She said as much, all I want is a place in the sun, Jim. I never thought much about it, but now the cottage is strictly part-time. This would be a permanent home, right? There was a dreamy look in his eyes. He obviously had some crazy idea of owning his own castle or something equally silly. Come on, Jim, we should go. I need to- Sure thing, you head off. I'll call you later. So, how much property do we get? Well, that's what I was saying, Mr. Harding. It all depends how much privacy you want. The smallest unit we do is a 500. Square meters? <laughs> no, no. 500 households per world. Imagine Earth, but with only 500 houses on it. Only five? Jump in Jehoshaphat! The biggest pass package is the sole occupier of the course. With that, you get an entire planet, 
No compromises, dwelling built on any location, any size. Roam the planet at will. And do they all have um, dinosaurs? No, oh, no, that's just for advertising. You wouldn't believe you'd been through the gate if all you saw was some grass, now would you? A whole world. Jim had a wistful sigh in his voice. <sighs> so, how much are these options, speaking purely theoretically? Jim, as a friend and a lawyer, I had to try and stop him before it was too late. Oh, you're still here. Don't worry. You go do what you need to do. I'll be fine and make my own way back. The smug look on Boonnich's face told me otherwise. But there's only so much a lawyer can do to protect clients from their own stupidity. And I knew I'd lost this one. Just promise to run everything by Joan and me before you sign anything, okay? He barely nodded before turning back to Budnich, who had already poured another glass of bourbon and handed it to, to Jim. So we're now having a scene break and moving a little bit further on in, on the story. The Hardings have decided to go ahead with their new house and have signed up for the most expensive option where they have an entire planet to themselves. After the construction of the house is completed, they throw a huge housewarming party to show off. And that was that. A few weeks later, I got a message from Jim, complete with three free simulations and walkthroughs. The house was a sprawling colonial affair on the shore of the alternate Earth's equivalent of Lake Winnipesaukee. I can't say that and I worth it. Winnipesaukee. It certainly wasn't the bastion of modernity that Jim had been angling for, but compromises are often the not so hidden cost of marriage, as I tried to explain to Rebecca on several occasions. I was involved with a corporate share deal that kept me busy for several weeks after that. So my next involvement with the Hardings project wasn't until I received an invitation to the launch party. Modern techniques mean houses are completed far faster than they used to be, but even I was surprised at the speed of construction. I approached the gate on 18th Street warily. I still didn't trust them or the company. Something I see all too frequently in my work is how many shortcuts are taken behind the scenes, often with disastrous results. I took a deep breath and entered the code Jim had sent me into the keypad and stepped in when the green light showed. I had a momentary shiver, probably psychosomatic. Then the door opened into a lustrous setting, the like of which I hadn't seen since my honeymoon in Hawaii 17 years ago. There were no signs or directions to guide me, but a well laid out stone path led off to the east. I glanced backwards to check if the gate was still there. Something made me want to leave right away, but that was probably my imagination too. The gate was there, a reassuring black and silver cylinder poking up from its base, like an elevator that had escaped from a shopping mall. And I turned to follow the path. The air was sweet like honeysuckle and warm enough that I took off my jacket within a few meters. The invitation said beachwear, but the hessel flesh wasn't so casually exposed to public scrutiny. The house was a triumph, a sprawling multi-level ranch with a facade of what appeared to be natural stone. It almost looked like a rock formation that had grown out of the ground rather than an artificial construction. There were clumps of pines dotted around the edges of the groomed areas. Either they'd been placed precisely or the house construction had been incredibly non-disruptive to the surrounding environment. It looked like they'd been there for years. I'm not a tree specialist, but I was sure it took decades, if not longer, for trees to grow that tall. To one side of the house was a wide stream that sluggishly flowed into the turquoise lake on the far side of the house, perfect for swimming or boating. And as I walked further, a well-dimensioned dock came into view. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, I muttered to the manicured clumps of greenery framing the path. The route led directly up a wide portico for entrance framed by what looked like polished white marble, but I didn't follow it and skirted around to the side to wor worship the rest of the building. At the rear, a low patio surrounded what I assumed to be freshwater, a freshwater pool, which seemed 
the height of overindulgence as next to it there was a white sanded beach leading directly into the lake. The patio was wide and looked large enough to entertain the entire World Congress, which, judging by the throng gathered there, might actually have been the case. Several children were hooting from the pool, though I didn't spot either Betty or Mura, and I wondered if Joan had pressed them into the hostess duties. Doug? I heard a woman's voice call out and looked around. Joan was waving at me from near the house. She gestured to the glass in her hand. Come have a drink. I weaved between the guests in less time than it takes to make a martini. I was next to her. And this was pretty fancy. You know, Jim, he wanted to show off to the people at work. Oh, Muriel? I meant the house, not the party. I pointed to the palatial building beside it, past her shoulder. Isn't it wonderful? Where's that girl? <clears throat> Someone nudged me from behind. I glanced around and felt another tug in my waist. I looked down. Muriel was standing there, complete with tray and a Mai Tai. Her flaxen hair glistening in the evening sun. Greetings, Mr. Hessel. I took the drink. Since when have I ever been anything other than Uncle Doug? Muriel curtsied and skipped away while I sipped my drink. I've been teaching her some formal manners, and she's gotten rather carried away with it, I'm afraid. She's even started calling me and Jim Mr. and Mrs. Harding. Kids. They can be so obtuse. How would you know? You've never had any. True, but I used to be one. A shiny new service bot pulled up with a tray of canapes. It had a paint job resembling an old-style butler or waiter and hovered by my elbow. But Joan waved it away. Not now, Henry. She looked her arm through mine. I don't think many men ever really grow up, do they? Jim's over there cooking up some crangos on the barbecue. Crangos? Jim will explain. Joan led me through the crowd to a tightly packed spot on the patio. In the middle of it, Jim was cooking over the largest barbecue I think I'd ever seen. It matched the house grandeur perfectly and was more like something you'd see in the kitchen of a top shelf restaurant. He was wearing Bermuda shorts that showed off his sculpted bronze torso, of course. He also had a blue and yellow lie draped around his neck and shoulders. While he wasn't a male model, he was close enough to make other men around him reach for something to cover up with, including me. Glad you can make it, old boy. What do you think? Stunning. It certainly looks like a dream house. Is it as good inside? Even better. Have you got a drink yet? The barbecue sizzled and sent up a fan of flames. Jim turned back and flipped some food over. Got a juicy one here. Oh, you've got a drink. Well, have another. It's Friday. Try the food. Before I could say thanks, Jim was piling giant shrimp on my plate. They were pink and steaming, and my mouth immediately watered at the scent of buttery garlic seasoning. I suddenly remembered I hadn't eaten since lunch and took a large bite. The delicious taste melted my taste buds, and I smacked my lips appreciatively. Those are Krangos. At least that's what the NM people tell me. They live here. Incredibly easy to catch. I realized the taste wasn't quite what you'd expect. Like shrimp, but somehow more shrimpy, with a tang I couldn't place, and I felt a twinge of panic. Not shrimp? Prehistoric? Well, not exactly. What the prehistoric ones would be like if they'd survived to today, I suppose. Joe made some salad on, on the table. Is this stuff safe? Everything's safe. Didn't I tell you that? The bugs here, the um, pathogens, don't know what a human being is. I could say the same about some of my clients. Yes, 
well, the upshot is that there's nothing here that can affect people or cause problems like that. Eat up. There's plenty to go around. I'll show you how to catch them later. They just paddle around in the shallows, almost waiting to be caught. You did bring a bathing suit. The end. <laughs> That was cool. Thank you. Everyone. That was a lot of fun. That was a funny one. There was some great comedy. Was funny. <laughs> I'm afraid my friend just doesn't fit in the frame. He was cool. Oh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> he is cool. Wow. I can hear the Jurassic Park music. That's awesome. That's that cool. Origami to the new level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. So, again, we were discussing off air uh, when we're going to appear again. I'm on holidays the uh, last part of August, and Dave can't make it on the 8th of August. So Jenny, we're going to pop in. So uh, I'm not sure when we're going to do the next one. We might do it on the 1st of August, but I think that might be a bit of a press to get a third reader or a second reader in. So I'm not sure. Uh, we'll keep everyone updated uh, when that happens, and we'll post it again on the social media channels. But uh, Right now, we're not sure when we're doing a live read. I will be doing a, an excerpt from one of my books, and then uh, we need a guest author. So if you're a guest author and you're listening right now and you want to be on that live read, uh, reach out to me, and uh, we'll get you in. But we're going to need your excerpt probably by next week. So if you can do it that quickly, then we'll get you in. That would be super. Thank you for having were you me. Eating, were, were you eating Caroline's shrimp? Richard? It's actually... Uh, it's funny because they're not quite shrimp, and these aren't quite shrimp either. They're just paper. <laughs> Lots of fiber, though. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Maybe he oh. says, uh, Christy, she'd buy a home from you any day. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Me too. Yeah. Me too. That was awesome. <laughs> Oops. All right. I put that back in there again. Sometimes it acts slow. So, Jody, before we leave, thank you for coming on again. Uh, thank you for having me. appreciate you having you here. And, uh, thank you. We look forward to seeing you at the next author's meeting. And yes. I don't know if I can make the one in August, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, where can people find your books? Your Amazon. website and uh, where do you sell them? Uh, Amazon. I have a website. Um, what is your website? Pardon me? What's your website? Oh, um, can I send a link? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if you can put a link on here, though. I, I could probably well, put it in afterwards. Yeah, I have. I mean, if you go to my Facebook page, you can look up my name, Jody Swinnell, and then there's a link. Okay. There, and it t it's on Linktree. So then it has all everything kind of in a neat little row. So you can go to the website. You can go to Amazon. You can go to Goodreads. Um, they're available on uh, Ingram Spark, uh, Kobo. Draft to digital. There's a whole bunch. Smash, Smashbox. I think that's another one as well. Okay. So uh, Amazon's the main one that I know. That's that's the one I usually share the link to. So if you look at my name or the name of the title of the book, then usually it comes up. Sorry, I wasn't prepared. I don't. No, no, it's okay. So the book we read from today is that published? Yes, yes. That one came out I think uh, March. So that one's called Dark Reaction. And okay, cool. that one, uh, yeah, that one's been out for a couple months, and it's it's, it's my big novel. I did the the one that you bought, Richard, which right. was a novella, or novella. I'm not sure how that's pronounced, and a couple short stories and stuff like that. But yeah, Dark Reactions, my book. <laughs> and that that's good. I'm glad I met you because I want to pick your brain on uh, how you did your witch's research book. That'll we'll leave that for uh, another day. But uh, and Dave, uh, your book and where can we find your stuff? Where can we find the Brachiosaurus? <laughs> <laughs> and where can we he's, find the Brachiosaurus? He's cute. Yeah, he's cute. He <laughs> where, where can we find your books, Dave? So you can find my books on Amazon, Kobo. Barnes and Noble, pretty much every online bookstore out there. Uh, you can order them uh, through me, through my website, davidmkelly.com. Um, but yeah, they're they're kind of like available everywhere, really. And the story you read today, uh, "A Time in the Sun," um, is that a short story in an anthology, or is that on its own? That's on its own. It's a, a short story. Um, although, it, well, it's probably actually it's probably long enough to be classed as a novella but um yeah that's actually uh, on its own again available through amazon 
So that wasn't the whole story we read today then. Oh no. No, there is a been. lot more than that. Because <laughs> that could have been like it, that summed it up when we read the last line there. You, the, 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 you know, you could have left it right there and uh, we'd be happy. But uh, obviously, there's more. No, to it. there's, the there's a lot more to it. Uh, there's more to it at the beginning, and there's, okay, right. uh, there's more to it at the end. There's oh, cool. there's a whole kind of like middle section with like storms and everything goes wrong and. And then there's a real big twist at the end. <laughs> oh, now I have to find out what happened to my house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I might not have sold it in time. The real estate values are going to go right down. <laughs> so is there anything anyone else wants to say before we sign off today? I think we're good. Just yeah. thank you. Thanks again. No, thanks for oh, taking I appreciate it. it. Thank you. Well, yeah, so well, thanks, everyone. The, the reading was fantastic. Yeah, it was great. It was, yeah. it was a yeah. lot of fun. Even when you just saw my pizza guy go. <laughs> the box, the box was you great. Box was, you look great. Yeah, the, the pizza box was incredible. Yeah. Thank God I had the box, yeah. <laughs> okay, so thanks again, Jody, uh, for uh, making our live read awesome. And right. thanks, Christy and Dave. As always, uh, you guys make the Looking for Legends show uh, rock. So until we meet again, uh, everybody, it's either going to be August 1st or it'll be the second Tuesday in September. We'll let you know. Take care, everybody. Take care. Bye. Good night, everyone.